<laughs> you are consenting to be recorded. Okay. Um, all right. So this, this talk is going to be about a few of the objects that are in the collections of the Bergen County Historical Society. And some of the ones that I find the most interesting because I'm primarily interested in ceramics and the history of ceramics. So that's what I'm gonna be concentrating on. We're gonna be talking about three different types of artifacts tonight. The um, red earthenware and tin glazed earthen, oh crap, tin glazed earthenware and tin glazed tiles. So these are all in the collections of Bergen County. And I'm gonna be showing you some things that aren't in the collections, but those, those slides are gonna be labeled not in the collection of Bergen County. Okay. So these are all made of um, earthenware clay and earthenware clay is the most common kind of clay that's around, but it's obviously different colors. Red is much more common than buff colored but we've got both here in Northern New Jersey, but these were made in the Netherlands and this one was made here, very much here in Bergen County. Okay, so tin glazed has a lot of opaque tin in the glaze itself. So you make the body out of the buff color clay, then you cover it with this thick white tin glaze and then you paint on top of it. And you have to paint quickly because it's like painting on construction paper. You know, if you paint on construction paper, how the pigment kind of soaks in. And that's what happens here. And that's why a lot of times we've got these big broad brush strokes. And you can see here how thick the glaze is. It's like nail polish. And the problem is the glaze doesn't fit very well on the body. So a lot of times it flakes off. Now, um, where did tin glaze come from? Can you guys all see this on the on the right? Yes. Okay. All right. So the art of glazing with tin was developed in Iran. It traveled over to Italy. From Italy, it traveled to the southern Netherlands. And from the southern Netherlands, it traveled to the northern Netherlands. So this is what the Dutch potters were making in the um, 15th and 16th centuries. Very European design, pomegranates. But then in the early 17th century, a lot of Chinese porcelain started coming into um, Europe. And this is the style that was happening on Chinese porcelain. So you got these together and this is what happened. The European potters, the faience, tin glazed faience, delftware, they're all the same thing. So the faience potters started making Chinese designs on their tin glazed wares. And here, again, you can see how the design is supposed to be, um, supposed to be Chinese. So there's a Chinese central design, lots of Chinese looking figures here, but European flowers. Right now, and this is an example of a later uh, faience to the to the 18th century, not the 17th century. And you can see this is another European design. You've still got the Chinese-looking designs over here, but this is a European figure. It might be it, it's one of the goddesses, whether it's a Greek goddess or a Roman goddess with a cornucopia but you can see the combination of the Asian and the European. And later on in the um, 17th and the 18th century, the European potters went back to using polychrome colors, but the designs are still, um, you can see that they're very Asian influenced. They look very Chinese but the colors now are more European again. And this one is also in the collection. Uh, this one is in the collection. It's on display. This one is in the collection. I don't believe it's on display, but isn't that pretty, you know, the way the colors go with the design. It's, it's really very nice. Now, the only problem is 
when you see paintings of the 17th century, Dutch golden age paintings, you don't see the faience plates, you see pewter all over the place. Here we've got a big pewter platter and plates above the mantelpiece and on the table and a pewter bowl and a pewter plate here on the floor. You don't see faience very often in paintings. And I'm not sure exactly why, but possibly because it was easier to paint pewter or possibly because people mostly had pewter if they could afford it. Now, this is a middle-class household. Here's the father you know, with his back, the cap on that he had to wear for the christening of the child. And the mother is still over here in bed, you know, being fed broth out of a, out of a, a little vessel here that we'll take a look at later. But this is a Franz Hals a painting of the gentlemen of the regiment getting together to talk to each other about how brave they were in the wars. And you see here, they've got pewter also. So there's a platter here, and then each person has his own little plate. So you, we don't see him in the, in the pictures. Here, this is porcelain, Chinese porcelain and pewter. And we don't get pewter in archaeological context because it was reused. It was melted down. It was used for something else. And, and it doesn't preserve. We don't get it in the ground. But we do get the pieces of porcelain. And we do get the pieces of the faience. Now, I have no idea what's going on here. These baskets are usually used for cheese. But this doesn't look like it's cheese. And I was wondering if it was some kind of um, like fruit jelly, almost a, 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 a fruit leather thing that we would have today because you've got all these sumptuous items and all the sweet oh. stuff. Yeah, just, did somebody say something? No, okay, well, well, this is just something to think about, you know, what in the world is this? Okay, so going back to the vessels that are in the collection, we have the faience plates and this great faience bowl. So here you've got the Chinese porcelain plates and the Chinese porcelain bowls. And the Dutch potters were imitating them because this is much, much, much cheaper than the imported Chinese porcelain. But from a distance, it looks good. You can't tell the, the difference that much from a distance. Okay, here's the interior of this bowl with the fluted sides. And you'll see a Chinese one in a minute. You've got flowers at the center and then this sort of stylized around here. And this is where marks, where the, the, um, the tin glazed has worn away, possibly from stacking. No, I don't know, but it could be. And here's the side of the bowl, and you can see how this looks more European in here, but the outside looks very Chinese. Now, these symbols are taken from, this one is not in the collection. This is a, a English-made porcelain plate that has some of the eight Buddhist symbols on it. Now, what's on the bowl in the collection are very, very, very stylized eight precious things. See, this thing that looks kind of like it has mouse ears is probably actually the pearl. And this thing over here, I don't know, could be the rhomboid, could be the painting, you know, could be the musical stone, but... <laughs> These are the Dutch potters making their idea from a Chinese vessel that they were looking at or a drawing of a Chinese vessel that somebody showed them and doing it very quickly because remember the paint sinks in as soon as you go as soon as you put it on top of the, the tin glaze. You can't go back and change it. But can can you see how this might have metamorphosed? metamorphosed from maybe the coin or the mm -hmm. pearl into this. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, this bowl is not an ordinary bowl. It's a punch bowl. Punch was the most popular um, social drink in the 18th and into the 19th century. You know, people drank wine and beer just as every day with meals, but punch is when you get together. And if you look at the number of bottles and the number of lemons that these guys have gone through and, and the clock says it's 20 after one. So these guys have probably been carousing since it was since dark, but here you've got this big Chinese punch bowl right here, Chinese export porcelain punch bowl. And this is in the collection of the Historical Society, a very, very nice Chinese porcelain punch bowl, very well painted. And it's easier to paint on porcelain than on tin glaze because it doesn't sink in, but very fine brush strokes with a waterscape scene. These are the kind of scenes that Spode developed the willow pattern from, but these are the original ones with the, the pavilion and houses and a pagoda and pine trees. So maybe maybe we could get Gary to soak that off and repair it better. Yeah, reclue it. So, but it's a beautiful vessel. And here's the inside. And you can see, again, you've got flowers at the bottom and then these elements around here, but the tin glazed one is very simple compared to this. You know, this is the original, the other's the imitation. Okay, now going on to the red earthenwares. You can find red earthenware clay all over the place. Some of you might've seen it or dug it yourself when, when you were kids riverbanks, clay beds, it fires at a relatively low temperature. Porcelain clay is much rarer. You don't find it in a lot of places and you have to fire at a very, very high temperature. But uh, redware, red earthenware, fires at a relatively low temperature. You still need a kiln to really do it well. But most of them were produced for the local market and they're covered with a lead glaze and they're sometimes decorated with slip. Now I put this one in here, even though it's you know 200 years earlier than the redware vessels that we have, just to show you the variety that you could get. You could get a pan, you could get a little porringer, you could get a pitcher, a cook pot, a brazier down here, which would have had peat in it. Um, this is a museum reproduction that shows redware plates and dishes on the table. Now, this design is made with a light colored clay called slip. And this is one of the ones in the collection. And this design here is again, slip. And this is how it's made. See the shape of the vessel. A, the clay is rolled out flat and then a circle is cut out and slip is put on it with a slip cup. If you are interested in modern slipware, Robosonia redware is where I got this picture from. And most slip cups are not this nicely decorated. They did it for show. But the slip gets trailed out here. And then when it's dried a little, the whole thing is inverted over a mold that looks kind of like a, a flat salad bowl and it's pounded down. So the slip actually gets pounded down into the body for the most part. Okay, and here's another one that is in the collection. And you can see these have been very, very, very well used. Now, these are often called pie plates, but they're not. They were used for a lot of other things besides pies. But what happened is in the late 19th century, a ceramic historian named Edwin Atley Barber was talking to some of the potters who were still making them. And he kind of mistranslated the Pennsylvania Dutch. And ever since then, people have been calling them pie plates, but they were used for a lot more than pie. And they could have been used on a trivet. They could have been used in this kind of reflecting oven. 
or they could have been used here in a wall oven. Now, everything shown here is metal, but redware could have been used. And here's a, a, uh, another reconstruction, and they only show metal being used. And I think that they don't use redware in historic houses and historic cooking because, ironically, redware is now more expensive than the metal. And, of course, it breaks a lot more easily than the metal, so you're, you don't see it. Now, I put this one in here to show you how a bake oven would be used. To go back to here, here's the bake oven over here. Not every house had a bake oven, but a lot of them did. And the way you used it, I don't know how many of you guys know this, is you heated it up, you let a fire burn really fierce in here till it burned down to the ashes, and then you raked out the ashes. You usually did it with a turkey feather. The turkey feather was supposed to be the best thing for raking out the ashes. And then you would put your dishes filled with whatever or your bread in the oven. Oops, using that, to go back, using this, this peel probably to get it into the oven or, oh, this is the peel right down here. And then it would cook from the reflected heat of the bricks. And redware was often used that way, but as you can see here, it was also used over the fire. This is all blackening from being used on a trivet over the fire. And we did a little experimental archaeology. Um, somebody I worked with made a redware dish and we tried it out on a, on a charcoal burner and we found that uh, every time you used it, there would be soot, but the next time you used it, that soot would burn off most for the most part, and you get new ones. But this has been used an awful lot. Even here, you see part of it's spoiled off, but yet it's still been used after that because there's here the, here's the charring. And now these plates with these curly cues are supposed to be made by George Wolfkill, who was working right in your in your area, starting in 1837. And um, 1830, sorry. 1830, he came from Franklin County, Pennsylvania, and he bought an already established pottery that was there. And this is probably one of the things that he made. And this is possibly another one. I'm sorry for the lightness of the slide. This one is decorated with again, the trailed slip. You can see how the potter would have just swished around here and made this little design. But this one is decorated with a sponge. You take the sponge and dip it in the slip and then plop it down here on the plate. Kind of like, you know, when we were kids, you would do a design with a potato. You could take a potato and put it in ink and put it on something. That was, um, that was an activity for a rainy day when the grown-ups were just desperate to get the kids out of their hair. So, and here's the back of that one and you can see really how well used it is. And this is probably the line where, oh crap, it would have, the trivet would have probably set right here. So this would have accumulated around the side of the trivet, if you can see that. Now, Wolfkill came from Pennsylvania, from Franklin County, which is a little bit to the southwest of Philadelphia. And if I had seen this plate anyplace else, I would have said this was made in Philadelphia because this is a very Philadelphia design. And this was made with a slip cup that had three spouts. And then you can see that's three all over. And this is extremely Philadelphia, Philadelphia area design. But he came from Pennsylvania, so he brought his skills with him. But this is more typical of what is usually identified as Wolf Kill or Wolf Keel, George Wolf Keel. And, uh, so, and he worked in, in Newbridge at River Edge. And this one's great because it's dated, you know, 1848. So if this is what he was making when he got there in 1830, 
and 18 years later, his style had evolved like this, that's a possibility. What it would be really interesting to do with both of these is to do um, this thing called portable X-ray fluorescence, where you test the clay to see what minerals and things are in it. And it's non-destructive, so you don't have to take a sample or anything. It would be very interesting to see if this clay and this clay are the same, if the same source. Because I don't think we know where he was getting his clay and maybe his clay source changed between 1830 and 1848, but it would still be really interesting to do it. The problem is the machine is expensive, but if somebody is doing a project and this becomes part of it, then that's a possibility. And this is on the back of that dish. It says purchased in 1840 at the pottery shop made by George Wolfkeel. Now it also says unused and I don't think that's exactly correct because you see a little bit of charring here and you see all of the scratch marks and where here, possibly where it slid in and out of the oven, out of the bake oven. So this is another thing to look at. There's, there's lots, of, lots of stuff still to be found out about the vessels in your collections. Now, these are attributed to George Wolf Keel based on these squiggles here. Now, these two are very much alike. This one's a little bit different because you see, here he comes up with a slip cup down, around, once, twice. Oh, damn. And also here, down, around, once, twice. But here, it goes into three. Once, twice, thrice. Maybe because he had a little more slip in the cup? I don't know. Or maybe it was just a different day but you can see where the slip cup ran out of slip right here so he had to either fill it in or fill put more slip in the cup or turn it or something but these are very distinctive and all were probably made by george wolf keel and these were probably not made um for everyday use because they might have been given to somebody as a special occasion or they might have been given to somebody on a marriage or we don't we don't know but they have been used you can see here you can see the charring and you can also see how the slip has been worn away which you wouldn't get if they were just stuck up on the mantelpiece okay so now why did people stop using redware especially these dishes, because they're very practical. When we did our little experimental archaeology thing, we cooked a um, basically a, a corn pudding in it, a sapin, just cornmeal and water and a few other things we just put in there to see what would happen. And when we took it off the fire, it was still bubbling after 10 minutes because redware really, really retains heat so it's very good for even cooking. So why do people stop using redware? It wasn't mostly because of the lead glaze, because people knew about the problems with lead glaze by around 1800, 1810, and these are being used well into the 1860s, 1870s. But this is why, <coughs> because instead of cooking over the fire, people started cooking in stoves. And you can't use redware on a stove. It heats too quickly and it will break. So you have to use metal. And this is from 1868 and this is from 1870. Um, I really like this picture because it shows all the household goods of the people. It's by Henry Mosler and it's called um, Just Moved or Moving Day. And you can see the young family has moved into their new apartment, probably. They brought their stove with them. And here's where the stove is going to get connected. They've got their stove. They've got all their dishes. They've got their 
they're food safe and you can't, I took it, I cropped it. So you can't see they've got the mattress and they've got the cat and the cat is tied to the trunk because the cat would probably want to go back to wherever it was that they were living before. But this is why people stopped using redware because you couldn't use it on a stove. And the advantages of cooking over a stove instead of cooking over an open fire, well, you could probably just think about it yourself. It's easier to control. You don't run the risk of burning yourself every time you're working at the fire. But <coughs> the disadvantages are you have to um, you have to think in a shorter term than in a longer term. If you're thinking over a stove than if you're cooking over a, a, a hearth. Okay. Now here's another kind of redware that uh, George Wolfkill made. It's called a porringer and it's a, like a cup, but it has a handle. And to show you the uh, sort of the ancestry of the porringer, here's another Dutch 17th century painting with a, a little cook pot here. And you can see, again, we've got pewter, but we've got, this is probably a faience tin glazed bowl and stoneware, but here's the little individual eating vessel. And this is um, by, um, oh, let me get the names. Samuel Waldo, um, here. Here, it's called Old Pat, the Independent Beggar. Samuel Lovett Waldo in 1819. And he has a porringer here. So we've evolved from this to this. And one of the things I like about this painting, it's Nicholas May's The Prayer Before the Meal. And see how serene everything is and everything is peaceful, but what's gonna happen in about a minute? You see here, this cat is either gonna be on the table with his nose in the salmon, or he's gonna pull the whole thing, the whole cloth off the table. The knife is gonna go on the floor. The beer is gonna go on the floor. My bet he's gonna hop up on the table and have his nose in the salmon. See him right here. That's one of the things I really love about this Dutch 17th century paintings. You have the main idea and then you get, uh-oh, something else is happening. Whereas this, it's very straightforward. You know, here there's a lot going on. Okay, now these jars are also in the collection and they, might have been made by the same potter. They probably were, but you can see the difference in the height of the neck. The handles are very much alike. And this just might have been the difference between one day's production and another day's production. But the colors are due mostly to where they were in the kiln. How much oxygen it got in the kiln or how much oxygen it didn't get in the kiln. And the way the decorations were put on here is again with a sponge that would be dipped into glaze that had either manganese or iron oxide added to make it dark brown. Lead glaze by itself is colorless. This might have had a little bit, oh, it's light yellow. So this is probably without any pigment in the lead glaze. This might have had some pigment in the red glaze, but looking at the body, probably the color is just due to the firing conditions. And of course, jars were used for storage for all sorts of stuff. This is a detail of a um, 1814 painting by John Lewis Crimmel. It's called Blind Man's Bluff. And here you've got a jar on top of the wardrobe and a jar on top of the mantelpiece. And here is another jar that is in the collection. These are really nice. And it's amazing that they survived because they were just utilitarian things. 
All right, now, moving on to the last thing that we're wanting that we were going to be talking about tonight is the tiles. And these are from the collection and they were taken, as far as I understand, from um, old houses that were being demolished. But you can see that there's different styles. They've all got the same corner element, this thing that's called a bug, but they're different styles. Now, wall tiles had the purpose not only of decoration, but also of making things easier to clean. Here they are around a Dutch style fireplace. Now, Dutch style fireplaces didn't have jams. They, it's a little hard to tell from this picture, but they're all flat against the wall. And these are chunks of peat that the servant is putting into the fire. And there would have been a lot of smoke and a lot of soot. And this was supposed to keep the smoke out of the room, but this would make it easier to clean around the fireplace. And also where the wall meets the floor, because when you're washing the floor, then you wouldn't get the wall messy because the wall would have been um, plastered and maybe, um, maybe painted with milk paint, but maybe just plastered. So it was easier to keep clean when you had the tiles here. Now, all of the tiles that are shown in the Dutch paintings, almost all of them, are very simple. And that's probably because it took a lot of effort to do the painting. So it was easier to paint a simple one than it was to paint a complicated one. But some of the tiles have very, not very complex, but pretty complex pictures. And the tiles were sold um, based on, when you, when you see records of tiles for sale, they're based on what kind of scene they have. And this would be considered a landscape or and a waterscape. These two are obviously made by a different painter. And the corners, the bugs in the corners are different style. So they were probably made in a different factory. But you get sort of the same idea of a landscape but they probably would not have been used together because you would have used tiles that match in the original installation. And these are examples of children's games, Kinderspiegel. And I do not know what games are being played here, unless this is a top, I'm not sure. But this one, if anybody's got any idea what games these are, please let's talk about it because I don't know but they're definitely Kinderspiegel and they are probably made in the same factory. The, uh, maybe not by the same painter, but probably in the same factory. Now, biblical scenes were very, very, very common in tiles, but usually the biblical tiles would have written underneath them what chapter and verse they came from. Now, these things that look like snails are actually sheep. So looking at this picture, these pictures, I was wondering, and they're definitely painted at the same factory based on the trees and the people. I was wondering if this wasn't maybe um, something to do with the story of King David where Saul sends Samuel out to find the, the worthy shepherd that, who became King David. You know, I, I don't know. It certainly helps when there is a, um, a verse, but there's not. And one of the things about the tiles, to go back to this one, the ones around the chimney, you could see not from this picture because this is a merchant counting as gold coins, but you could see a family sitting around the fire at night and telling the stories that they saw on the tiles, especially the Bible tiles. 
they would have been used for instructing children in Bible stories or just telling stories. And it would have been where the family was, where the family was together. So you might want to have the most interesting tiles you could find just because it would be fun to talk about them. Hmm. Now, this one, these two, again, shepherds and shepherdesses were a very common theme. This is possibly Moses because on the tiles, Moses is often shown with these things that have been identified as horns, but they're actually supposed to be rays of light because in um, Michelangelo's painting in the Sistine Chapel, Moses has rays of lights coming out of his head. So the tile painters often painted Moses with horns. But I don't know what Bible story this could be. And if anybody has an idea, you know, please, please say so. Definitely a shepherdess. She's got her sheep. She's got her, her shepherd's crook here. But who is he? What is he offering her? But I could certainly make up a story about this. You know, if you had to entertain three, four, five-year-old kids, even older, while you're sitting around the fire till they fell asleep, you could certainly make up a story about this. And this guy here, I think he's a cow herd because he has the horn to call the cows. But he also has a shepherd's crook, so maybe these are still sheep. Now, whoever made this collection can find themselves to the ones with the bug corners because there's a lot of other corners that you can get on tiles, but all of the ones that I saw in the collection have the bug corner. Okay, all right. I just wanted to end this formal talk part of the talk mm -hmm. with this Chinese porcelain tea caddy that is also in the collections, but not on exhibit. And a tea caddy, this is, this is, of course, not in the society's collections. It's from, I got it from the internet. A complete tea set would have had a tea caddy that had the tea leaves in it. And as the, the lady was making tea, when the tea ran out, there would be hot water in a hot water jug. And you put the hot water in and you'd put the tea leaves in and continue making tea. And then a complete tea set would have had a teapot, a hot water jug, a creamer, this one doesn't have, a tea caddy, coffee cups, tea cups and saucers. And what's left of the set is this tea caddy. And I think this is a pseudo armorial design. See what happened after 1783 when American merchants started to deal directly with um, China, you could send an order to China and expect to get porcelain back, a tea set back in, in two years or so. And these were, the blue was done in the main kilns of Qingda Chen, but then this, which is overglazed, was done in Canton where the merchants came and if you were a family that had arms, your coat of arms would be here. But if you were a family that didn't have arms, you would put something in to kind of sort of look like it was arms. And I think this red squirrel is pseudo armorial. But it, this is a really lovely vessel. And, you know, we don't know where the rest of it, of the tea set is, but whether it was made for America or whether it was made for somebody in England, you know, I don't know, but um, it's a red squirrel. So that might indicate England rather than the United States, but it's here now. So, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And that was kind of a quick run through some of the vessels that are in the collection. And do you guys have questions or comments, please? Do we want to unmute?
I, I do believe that the fruit that's in the plate is probably a peach marmalade. I'm sorry? I believe that the fruit that's in the plate that you were showing uh -huh. is, is a peach marmalade. Oh, OK. That would make sense. That would make sense. Um, because there's all of the, the sweet stuff in there, plus the oysters. So it's all luxury. When you see the paintings with porcelain and fruit, fruit is a luxury item. Sometimes it's also put in there to remind people of the choice between good and evil, you know, that the... the I, I thought it might be caviar, but then caviar would drift down, but it that's, really looks like that, caviar to me. Yeah, I, I was thinking caviar too, but then I thought, no, it had dripped down. So it's got to be something, you know, viscous. Right. But <laughs> Could you just uh, once again tell, tell us how I got a little confused about the tin. You got, you got a red a plate and then you put the tin on it. Okay. It's a liquid um, tin. I, forgive me, I don't understand. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have explained that a bit better. Um, lead glaze has been used on ceramics since the time of the Romans, but the in, in invention of tin glazed or faience or mayolica, somebody in Iran, some brilliant potter in Iran, discovered that if you put powdered tin oxide into the mostly into the lead glaze, if you put a lot of powder tin oxide in, you would get an opaque white surface. So it's starting with a lead glaze, but putting in powder tin oxide so that you give yourself that kind of a palette. You know, just, just very decorative. So. Yeah, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, that uh, tea set you showed before, uh, the number 25 and the uh, tea caddy, where was that from? Um, from China. The the last the last slide? Yeah, the one with all the cups and the creamer that you said wasn't there. Oh. Um, you said you got the picture off the internet? Yes, I did. It was one of the auction houses. I can't remember which. Uh, well, I'll, I could tell you in a second. Um, hang on a minute. It was... Um, let's see. It was... Um, saleroom.com is where I got that from. And it's from China. Yes. And well, it was made during um, the, the King Long period, 1736 to 1796. See, the, the influences went both ways. The European potters started copying Chinese porcelain with their blue on white background. But then the Chinese potters started copying European polychrome colors. So you start getting polychrome on Chinese export porcelain around 1720. And it becomes very common during the 18th century. So it, it's, it's really fascinating because these potters never meet each other. Some are in China, some are in Europe, but they see what the others are making. and they make adjustments, they make inventions in what they're doing themselves so that they can appeal to the market. You know, and um, in, in China, there was a completely different market for export. So that's why we call it Chinese export porcelain. It wasn't for the domestic market. It was to get sent down to Canton to, send, to be sent out to Europe. Okay. You said that the... Uh, uh, Chinese started to develop, they started to imitate the, uh, the chrome colors from Europe. Was all Chinese uh, pottery before that blue and white? Um, no, no, not at all. But um, it was applied in a different way and there was a different palette. It's, it's the pink that really starts being, being used in the 1720s. And it, it was a different technique. It was more enamel than paint. And um, I'm, it, it's it's kind of technical, and I, I'm I'm not a potter, but um, there's a there's a site on the internet called Gothaborg.com, 
that talks about a lot of this. It's a, from a Swedish collector. So yeah, but if you look at some earlier Chinese porcelain, um, it's called Femi Vert, which has a lot of green in it. But um, Femi Rose is the European colors starting after 1720. So that uh, that set that I showed that from the auction house is definitely Femme Rose. So, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. I, I have Cindy. a question, Cindy. To ask you, yeah, the the uh, blue and white uh, plates. When you said they had to apply it quickly, uh huh, soaked in. Did they did they do it like the inside and then that quickly and then work on the outside? Is that how they did it? Because you know, I don't know. I don't know, and I no. suspect it depended upon the potter. You know, the well, the individual illustrator. Talent of the yeah, because by the 17th century in the Netherlands there were factories. Now we were talking about George Wolfkill. Uh -huh. He probably worked with a couple of helpers, or maybe by himself. But the the tin glazed the faience factories in the Netherlands in the 17th century they were factories. They would have. Um, tens of people working there with people who were specialized in the forming the body, people specialized in the glazing, and then of course the painters. Oh. And the painters would have been the, um, they, would have, they would have been the, the alpha guys. Yeah, the masters of it, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I have one more question. The red earthenware, you said it had, was, had lead, and, but yes. that didn't stop them from using it. You said they had- You're right. Um, as I said, lead glaze has been used since the time of the Romans, yeah. and the, people knew about the problems with lead glaze starting in at least the late 18th century, but they continued to use redware vessels with lead glaze well into the 19th century, probably to like 1870, 1880, depending upon when a person got a stove, because it wasn't considered to be that horrible, but if you read cookbooks, 19th century cookbooks, you're advised not to store vinegar in a lead glazed jar or not to put anything that is harsh, is how they describe it, or acidic in a lead glazed jar. So cooking in that pie plate, like cooking a um, sapin, you know, cornmeal mush and that kind of a dish probably would not have um, been very harmful. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have um, recipes that you associate or types of food besides the pies with them? Well, the, the sapin, you know, the cornmeal, uh -huh. definitely. And again, looking at some 19th century cookbooks, some of them call for an earthen dish. Now, whether that earthen dish is a dish or a pan, you know, which is deeper, we, we can't be sure but you kind of have to extrapolate. Mm -hmm. So, but it, it would be good for pie, but you could use it for other things. And on the, on the tiles, you referred to those corner icons as bugs. Right. Were they, they do look like bugs. Were they bugs or just a um, fanciful design? I, that's what antique people have been calling them for, you know, the past. Mm -hmm. They're usually called a spider's head. And I, I should have said spider's head. And whether that was what they were supposed to be, I think they were probably another oriental thing that got stylized. And, and um, I was it, very interested when I visited Salem, Massachusetts many uh, years ago. That they had, I, I don't know, is it a branch of the Peabody up there? It was a magnificent museum. But they were importing, they were the centers. I remember of the importation of Chinese stuff uh -huh. in that area. It was just unbelievable. Was there? An, was New York a center too, or was Salem the East Coast? Well, there, New York was a, Salem. I, I'm not sure of the exact amount of imports, but it was Salem, New York, Philadelphia, uh -huh. and uh, Savannah. Uh -huh. So, but that, that is a great museum and they have collected a lot of, a lot of stuff there, but it was where the ships sailed out of the, Philadelphia too, especially because the um, Philadelphia at that time was the center of enterprise in the United States. 
you know, much as us New Yorkers don't like to. Well, I could see New Yorkers, I uh, mean, who we think of today, a little more cosmopolitan. Somehow I, I can't see John Adams with a Chinese bowl in his living room, but he may have had it. I don't, uh, you know, it was interesting in that area of the country that they imported that stuff. There's there's a, a, a kind of a famous quote in Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, which I can't exactly remember, but he talks about coming down to breakfast one day and finding that his wife had purchased a Chinese porcelain bowl, and he's bemoaning the fact that she wasn't um, satisfied. I can't remember if he calls it a plain earthen bowl or a pewter bowl, but that she felt her husband had to keep up with the times and have his morning grill out of a porcelain bowl. Yeah, he, yeah. he was a real curmudgeon when it came to his wife. So, well, Gordon Wood, historian. Much. Very much, and thank you so much. Thank you. You too, Deb. It was great. Yeah, you've got you've got a great. It's so interesting. Yeah, sure. it would be. I really um, loved it. It would be. Very interesting to um, catalog the whole collection in, in a um, something like an access database where there's- Yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> it's uh -huh. uh, one of the projects to, um, well, it's a long story, but- Yeah, but- um, Put everything a... you know about an object in one place is my goal. Um, <laughs> yep, uh, well. You do have you do have some beautiful things, and, and I, I I would guess it's all of the people who belong to the society over the years that have contributed to it. Yeah. Well, and we had collectors too uh, early on, um, you know, who you because you see their names repeat through the yeah. collections, so they were going out deliberately trying to find things and add it. Francis Westervelt was one of the more well-known ones. Mm -hmm. She was actually the 13th, I believe it is, uh, president of the organization. And she, she, her name was on the back of some of those pottery pieces, yeah. but she yeah. uh, wrote, went and collected and she wrote about them. Um, she, she wrote about the wampum and mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's so fortunate when somebody has that presence of mind that, you know, and see them see their the history they're part of you know and can yes. take that initiative yep uh, yep absolutely <laughs> instead of instead of not not treasuring things you know we need to we need to treasure them and that's why your organization is so great because you're keeping it all together mm.